We're going to get going today. We're going to have some introduction stuff. And I'm going to introduce you guys to some of our drones. And hopefully, assuming the wind isn't too crazy, we're going to go out into the North Quad and just do, you know, a few seconds of flying just to begin to get us uh, in the field. In general, once we get going, we're not going to spend a huge amount of time in this room. Um, so generally speaking, we're going to come in, grab stuff, and then go outside and, and you know, for the most part, be out and about. Um, if it's windy or if it's raining or, or something else is weird, of course, we'll be in here as our default. But um, we won't necessarily be, we definitely won't be in this room every single day, three hours a day, all that kind of stuff, just so, so people know. Um, uh, I will go over safety, I'll refresh us on our safety stuff once I, I go through this intro stuff um, today. Um, but I assume everybody here should know, but just in, in case you don't, bathrooms and water fountains, everything down the corridor uh, to the left, uh, uh, vending machines and all that good stuff. Um, okay. Also, you guys always interrupt me. So if I'm saying something too fast or something isn't clear, just, hey, Dr. A, wh what was that? I didn't get that. It's all good. Cool? So today's lecture isn't so much for you guys to memorize anything, this is more just conceptually to orient us to what we've been doing with uh, drones here. Um, and I will say that I'm super stoked you guys, give yourselves a hand. That was sort of a wimpy hand, like, give me that big hand. Yes, 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 awesome. So, um, so I, we started this, when did I put this class? I created this class about a decade ago um, and it was the first of its kind, uh, definitely here on campus, but, but in a lot of the country, actually, when we first started teaching these uh, tools. Um, uh, and especially in the early days, people would confuse us with an, uh, today still, with an engineering, they think we're an engineering lab or something when we go do projects with people or, or you know, something like an aeronautical uh, firm kind of thing. Um, and that's not us. Uh, to be super clear, drones are cool, drones are neat. But I don't really care that much about drones. What I really care about, and I suspect what most of you really care about, even though they're a fun technology and all that kind of stuff, what most of us care about is the power that this stuff can give us, the data that it can give us, the insights that it can help us uh, understand about the natural world, the efficiency with which we can collect a lot of data to answer really pressing societal or environmental questions much cheaply, faster, affordably, safely, all that kind of stuff. Then than historically. That's why we care about it. So we're completely technologically agnostic. Um, so even though I, I have some slides later on in this lecture, I'll just I'll start by showing um, you guys all of the things that are around you in the lab right now um, are some of our flotsam, some of the stuff that we, uh, and jetsam, some of the stuff that we've sort of found over the years, and other cases, things that we used to use for this class and other student projects that we've now abandoned. So, for example, um, the, thing, the, the, the fixed wing over that desk right there, that guy, we built that, our students built that, one of my earlier classes built that, um, to go to one of our service learning classes in the South Pacific, uh, to the Cook Islands. And so that thing is designed to be pulled apart and fit into a suitcase, so we can check it on the plane, go fly, and then get there and, and assemble it and, and fly. With that thing, we could fly up to 14 miles away from where we were, where we we're holding the controller. Uh, not a lot, at least especially back then, was not allowed in the U.S. Even though the technology is developed in the U.S. and is super, super simple, and remote control airplane uh, enthusiasts have been doing this for a long time, the new rules, which we will talk about, the new rules from the FAA said we have to stay what's in known, of, known as a line of sight. So we have to be able to see it, which is, I mean, it varies, but we're talking basically about a mile or so is generally speaking the farthest away you can get. Um, and and that, was, that was not driven by technology concerns, that was driven by safety concerns and, and making sure that people weren't doing something silly. Uh, anyway, so, so we built that and, and, and just had a simple, in the belly of that thing, the data collection device is just a simple point and shoot camera, basically, right? So something you just get off eBay or, or Amazon or whatever. That worked really, really well for mapping coral reefs and, and the stuff we were doing. Um, but when we build something like that, we have to build it. And then we go out to Camp Park, which you guys will become intimately familiar with this semester. You know, we go out there and then we crash it. And like, oh, God, and we'd like kind of fix it. And then we'd like do it again. And then, oh, and then we crash it, and, right? And so, so that's how we were the first several years. We made everything ourselves. Um, 
we've left that time for the most part. The technology has gotten so good. The off the shelf stuff has gotten so cheap and so good. It, I, mean, I mean, if you want to do that, that's still great. The, the, the thing up there, the, this guy, this guy is a, is a type of a, of a drone that is a sort of open design that you can add things to and tweak things to. Um, and so you can still do that. But for the most part, for our concerns, our environmental assessment concerns, we're mostly talking about taking a visual picture of something, taking a thermal picture of something, something, you know, something fairly straightforward. Or in the case of uh, some of our oil and pollution monitoring, sniffing the air, so flying something over, sniffing the air. Right before the pandemic, we were, we were, built, we were going to build a snot bot which is this, uh, essentially a drone with a sponge on the bottom and fly it through some of the snot of, of the humpback whale mothers as they were, were breaching with, with our project in Maui. That got derailed from the pandemic, but, but that kind of stuff, occasionally we do that, but mostly we're just taking pictures. And so for that kind of stuff, off the shelf is, is just slick. And you don't need to spend six months testing it. Is it gonna work? Is, you know, da, 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 da. So we've gone through so many years of, of hacking together things and as fun as that was, um, it was time we weren't getting data, or time we weren't analyzing data, or time we weren't helping with the resource management question uh, uh, at hand. So, um, I'll talk about more when I go into this about some of our um, history around here. But, um, but uh, yeah, so, oh, this thing wants me to do something here. Um, okay, so, uh, so we've had a whole history of that. This class has evolved. So when this class first started, we, start, we were flying, and then, um, and then, uh, uh, it got super popular, and people were being stupid, unsafe. And so there was a, I think it was a TGI Fridays, something like, it was, yeah, I think it was a TGI Fridays, back east. I think it was in, it was either New Jersey or New York, and it was getting near Valentine's Day. And so it was sort of a big cavernous, you know, kind of like downtown, big urban warehousey kind of restaurant space. And so it was, uh, it was getting near, I think it was Valentine's Day. I guess it could have been St. Patrick's Day for a Blarney. So anyway, this business owner thought it'd be great to put one of, uh, one of the Phantoms, which will, you'll become intimately familiar with, the classic drone looking drone, um, inside his restaurant, indoors, and fly it around and point it straight down and go up to couples and call it the kiss cam. And so go, hey, kiss her, kiss her, or kiss him, kiss him. And then they had a big television screen where they showed sports and they're like, well, put that up on the screen. And so they'd fly it around inside the restaurant, right? Uh, even today, that's sort of, even with all the sensors, I mean, that, like indoor flying is, it can totally happen, but it's, it's a little tricky, right? And they were having essentially the bus boy fly this around, right? This wasn't a professional pilot. This wasn't a, you know, it's just like, hey, do you have a, oh, a drone? Okay, we'll bring it to work on Monday or whatever. So they're flying around. They flew over this one couple. And as you would imagine, there was an accident. The, the drone bumped into the fan or what, I don't know what exactly happened. And it, it started spinning down and crashed. And it crashed into this lady's face. Thank God the prop hit her just below her eye. So she cut open her cheek, but that was all. But she was a professional photographer. And she said, man, if that thing had hit my eye, it wouldn't have just had problems for my life. It would have, you know, I wouldn't have been able to work. And so it got all this press and then everybody freaked out. And that led to this huge cascade of everybody like, whoa, whoa, let's pull back from drones. Let's pull back from drones. So that happened. Um, let's see, do I, do I have a photo of this somewhere? jumping ahead on my story. So the scary dairy out near where we will be flying, out near our airfield, um, this, old, this old hay barn, this old steel structure of a hay barn, uh, uh, just as we were getting ready to, to do the next class, uh, the FAA basically said, no flying, no flying unless you had um, a new set of safety considerations. That first set of con safety considerations was a pilot's license. So to fly an airplane, so to fly a drone, so you could be a hobbyist, so you could be like a 12 year old and buy something off of Amazon and fly it. But if you were a commercial operation 
or an educational option. Actually, education, didn't e they didn't even have any rules for education. So they said you can't fly as education. So we couldn't train people. So we were working on people to be safe and be you know, safe operators of this technology, not hurt any critters, not hurt any people. And we were banned from training people to be safe, right? I mean, it was totally crazy. So um, all this stuff came in, every lockdown, and then our CSU system, which is always massively risk averse, they said, no drone flying. And while we were using drones for you know, several years at that point, we had other programs like at Cal Poly Pomona, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo that had actual aeronautical programs where they designed you know, airplanes and stuff. And they've been doing those for decades, right? And they were, everybody was grounded. And we're like, wait, what? Now everybody has to stop? So it was a completely crazy time. So that next class, I, w I got called in front of the, it got called the president's office, so Sean, like, we know what you do, and so you know the rules, right? You can't fly outside. And I was like, uh, can we fly outside a little bit? No, you can't fly. I'm like, but we have a class coming. How do I teach these students how to fly? Like, well, so you just have to deal with it. So we started, at that point, flying in this room with little teeny toy hobbyist uh, controls, uh, little things, which, it sounds crazy, but the basic controls are the same as the ones you guys will use. So initially, it's actually, it's not, it's, it's a good practice to kind of start doing that. We don't do that anymore because you guys were so upset. It, it's so much harder to fly the little toy ones than the ones we have because they have stability control that everybody's like, why did you make us do that for two weeks? That was stupid because these guys are so much better. So we started here, then we would go over to Grand Salon and then fly in a larger indoor space. And then we started going out here and flying out at the Scary Dairy, which was great. And we might have to use that parts of this year because we'll talk about something about the new FAA rule coming in. But in any event, um, so this is basically flying outside, right? So this is, if you guys haven't been out there, this is, a, this is like a three-story tall iron structure, right? but almost all of the metal is off of it. So it's just essentially a skeleton. So technically speaking, it's inside. <laughs> but you have the sun in your eyes, the wind's blowing. So it's, it's, it's an ideal place to be. So that year, we had to do all our flying inside. And oh man, everybody was so trying to get us in trouble. I'm like, inside, inside, inside. It's always, so, um, so our unique campus has really helped us do this do this training of you all, um, learn how to use this stuff. And so, so it's really evolved with our, with our campus really for the last you know, 10, 15 years or so. Um, okay, let's get back to talking about what we're gonna talk about. And so, um, okay, so uh, I first put this lecture together several years ago when we were starting up, but we still are at a pretty unique point in our time. Uh, when it comes to things like these remotely piloted systems, these, these flying robots and swimming robots and stuff. And it's really pretty cool. So the stuff you see around you, those 3D printers back there, there's a laser uh, etcher over there, and all these things are great. Now we don't use those to build drones from the ground up, although you could, right? So our partners at Fathomworks, our partners in the Navy, they have been piloting um, the ability to 3D print a drone on demand. So that maybe a warship or, or somebody in a disaster context, they maybe don't have, they don't need to carry all these parts everywhere. They can just carry the, the brains or the, the microcontrollers or some of the motors, which are much smaller, fit in a little box. And then let's say there's a big hurricane and they need to go see if people are hurt. They could 3D print the bodies of these drones and then slap the, the computer parts in and go. Um, so we're still in that part. We, we call this, this approach, this, this, this type of stuff, conservation mechatronics. So we have a mechatronics program. Is anybody in mechatronics program here? Okay, so we have, you know, which is, which is a, a type of engineering which combines physically moving stuff, you know, articulated parts as well as computer control parts. So we call this conservation mechatronics and that's what we do uh, here. Um, and we have all kinds of different examples we can talk about. Um, one of the newest ones will be this January. So this isn't super official yet, we're, st we're still planning it, but um, so I have a trip I normally take in the spring to New Orleans. Uh, we have a trip we take to Maui every other year. Both of these trips use drones. Um, so not necessarily the whole part of the class, but, but drones are a key part of the data collection we do for our partners in these. In, in both places, we essentially act like environmental consulting firms. So we go in and help collect data 
for um, nonprofits that don't have the, the people or the person power or the knowledge or the whatever, and we, we, um, we augment their work to do environmental justice and to do environmental understanding and education and management in their, in their various communities. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, but the newest one is January. So our, this is the cycle for our Maui trip. And it just so happens that, unfortunately, the Maui fires just happened, right? The Lahaina, Lahaina, Lahaina burnt down, where we are based out of, where, where our boats go out of, and, and that's where we do most of our organization, et cetera. Historically, that trip is only about the whales, or, or about the whales, right? So mother calf stuff. And we used to do that way back when, decades ago, from the boat. So people in a boat with binoculars and looking down. Now, we actually fly drones, and it's way better. Because instead of looking from the side and go like, oh, he's like kind of a big whale, we can look straight down over the whale and very accurately measure the mom and the baby and look at the condition. Is the mom really fat? Does she have a lot of good energy reserves? Or is she really thin? Has she been burning through her energy reserves? And is she, she ready to start to you know, migrate kind of situation? And so um, it's still planning, but we're turning that trip into something of a hybrid between our New Orleans class, which is focused on recovery from um, natural disasters and, and poor management, uh, with our Hawaii class. So part of that will need Part 107, uh, drone pilots. And so um, the part of the class that uh, Professor Seidel is doing, the knowledge stuff and how do you read an aeronautical map and all the, those important things, everybody should get their 107 before you guys graduate, right? So um, as he's talked about, um, because of the way it works legally, we can't give you, I can't give you the 107 test. It's administered through an FAA testing center. So you guys have to sign up for that outside of class and, and go to a, you know, an airport to do the, the comp even though it's just on a computer. Um, we'll just talk more about the stupid FAA uh, as the class goes on. Um, uh, uh, if, if you guys do that, and I don't know, is, has Jay said you guys get a free A on the midterm or has he said anything about that yet? Okay, so we usually do, if you pass that test, and so that test is just like, whatever it is, 70% or above. Doesn't matter what your grade is, on, but you pass that, and you get an A on whatever it is. I, I can't remember if it's our midterm or our final or whatever. So you just get out of doing the test, right? What's the nearest FAA testing center? Uh, so uh, <laughs> there's, uh, I think you can take it at Camarillo Airport. There's also one in Van Nuys. Um, so there's several. So, so it's more when you guys are ready, go sign up and, and, and it'll tell you, um, it's, it's like going to the DMV or whatever, like, or, or like Quest Diagnostics for a blood test or something. Like you, you go to sign up and they'll say, hey, for this time, here are the locations that are available and the dates that you're interested in. How do we know when um, we'll talk about that. You guys won't be ready. So, so the stuff that Professor Seidel is running through, you got to go through that stuff first. So in like a month or so kind of thing. Um, it really is not that, it, yeah. Well, let's put a pause on that. I'll talk more about that later. It's everybody here can pass it. Even if you guys have never touched something, you do need to study for a week or two, but it's not like you need to study for months and months and months and months and months. Um, and most of it is really helpful. I'm being a little silly, right? It, it is good knowledge. It's, it's important to know. Um, my critique of the FA, which will go on throughout the semester, is that, um, and I, I don't mean to be overly negative about an, an agency that's working on safety and everything, um, but how they've handled drones, they completely screwed the pooch. And they've made us less safe, I would argue, despite what they'll tell you. And they've made us less safe because they've made everyone skeptical of the FAA. Because they've made the FAA seem so silly and so, so unrelated to reality that people think it's just a government thing or it's just some bureaucratic thing, as opposed to a real genuine concern for safety. So for example, to, be a, to get your commercial drone license, the Part 107 license, there is no research license. So there's, there's no, which we'd love to have, but there's no such thing. So what we do for uh, a preponderance of, safe, uh, of, um, of caution and being conservative, we require, not for this class, not for this class, but if you guys want to do research with me or Dr. Patch, or you want to come on our classes and fly the stuff, um, which would be great, or you want to do, use drones for your capstone or whatever it is, we require you to have the 107. And then it's, it's just better, it's be, right? And then when you graduate, you have that. It's another certification. And you can go work for a consulting firm. You can go work for whatever um, and, uh, and, 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 be, and be good to go. Um, 
Uh, where was I going with that? Uh, oh, yeah. So, so the FAA has a written test. I don't have any problem with a written test. There is no practical test. So what I would argue is actually probably more important than just, they're both important, but more important. It'd be like saying you go to the DMV and you took a written test and you get in a car. And it's all good, right? No problem. Get on the freeway. Merge. No problem, right? So, so we should have both, right? But for historic reasons, the FAA didn't go that route. Um, so anyway, but our January class, we're going to need drone pilots. So we're going to go to Maui and we're going to both work on, um, at least this is the plan, it's not official yet, so it's not, but, but what we're working towards is um, to raise some money to be able to take more students, because our plan was, we, that class is normally fairly small, to take more students than we normally take and we'll work in teams. So some folks will be out doing the whale stuff. When the other teams aren't there, they'll be on land doing uh, disaster recovery and mapping of natural systems and helping with the recovery. So it was a super unique thing, right? It's, it's, will never happen again, right? Hopefully. Although this has happened several times in New Orleans and other places. But, um, but a really unique opportunity. So I hope all of you guys consider coming with us uh, to that class. Um, again, details to come. The trip is between New Year's and the start of the semester. So, the, so you, it's, you get units for it, but the, the actual experience is, in, is not when we have classes going on. Uh, we need drone pilots for that. Our drone pilot crew was decimated by COVID. Right? This class was decimated by COVID. This was the last class we were, able, we were allowed to bring back. Because when we're out there as flying, you guys are going to be totally safe. There's not, nothing's going to go wrong. It's going to be cool. Every, if somebody's even going to crash a drone, and like, oh my God, well, you know, it's, it'll be fine. It'll be fine, right? I'm supposed to say, don't crash a drone. But you know, it's like, it'll be cool. Don't, um, people shouldn't have fear or worries. Oh, I don't know how to do this. I don't want to touch it and break it. No, no, no. You guys will all have hands on, and you guys will be experienced with how these, these tools work. Um, uh, but um, uh, you know, there's there's sometimes is is some some worry. What was I going to say about that? Um, there's something I was going to say that I just lost. I just skipped out. What was I what was I talking about? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, right, right. So so before every the students that knew a lot would tr would work with the students that didn't have much experience. And, and we had this wonderful project. And so we, we had many projects. So we'd have, we'd have 10, 15 um, Part 107 certified pilots at any one time in our lab here, both to help out with classes, but also to help out with research. Because the COVID protocol said, in addition to having to wear masks, we had to stay, um, we had to stay uh, you know, more than five feet away, five, six feet away from someone. The FAA specifically says that when we're training people, I have to be within five to six feet in case it's not going to happen to you. In case you started flying into a freeway or going into an eagle's nest or something, theoretically, I or Zach or whoever's maybe helping us out that day could grab the controls and you know be safe. And so, so the pandemic made us unable to to offer the class. And so, and so we just lost that. And then when we weren't doing that, then people weren't doing that. And then when we weren't doing the class, people weren't getting the 107s. And so it sort of played, made this feedback loop. So we're, we're rebuilding our drone core. And so our, our, our program, because we do so many different things, Dr. Patch is mapping the beach, and in New Orleans we're mapping vegetation, and in Hawaii we're doing whales, you have a really unique opportunity this year and or next year to get a bunch of experience flying in different, on different projects. Most folks, most folks, so my, my um, son was just working on his application to do this research at this um, marine station in Australia where he is, and he was writing his qualifications and he says, yeah, I've flown, because he, in the pandemic, he became one of our drone pilots, he was in my bubble, so it was legal for me to stand next to him. And so we had a bunch of projects monitoring oil spills and things like that and, and, and beaches. And so he became our drone pilot um, for the pandemic. Um, so he was submitting his application and he said, I have 4,500 uh, flight hours. And this guy was like, I think you have a typo. Like, how do you have 4,500? He's like, yeah, no, I got four. It's like, that's 187 days like, of continual flying. It's like, yeah, I know, I've been doing a lot of flying because these guys don't have any drone pilots. So, um, <laughs> so you guys probably won't get 4,500, but it's, our program is a unique place to be able to get a lot of airtime doing research, right? Um, and so that's, that's a great thing on your resume if you choose to do that. If, before I go on here, um, I'll also say, uh, I'll also say, um, even if you don't think you want to use drones, 
like, yeah, this is cool. I'm doing this because it's a graduation requirement. And, uh, um, it's a great skill to have. What we find is many of our students that are, you know, took a class, but you know, it's cool, but it's not really my jam. When they get to their agency, when they get to their consulting firm or whatever it is, invariably something happens. Maybe it's a wildfire, maybe it's a new project that burbles up, I'm like, oh my God, we gotta go. Who knows how to fly drones? And all the people are like old farts like me, like, drones, like, what well, a technology, I can't do it. And they end up becoming like, becoming the drone person. And so not that they have to do that for a living, but having that as one of the arrows in your quiver is really, really helpful for your professional career and stuff. So, so that's, my, that's my pitch there. Okay, so um, drones are everywhere. They're at, at the Super Bowl and all that kind of stuff. Um, so like this kind of stuff, right? So, so uh, one of our graduates used to run this program for Intel. So this is, this is all um, not, not individually controlled, but robotic, uh, but uh, computer controlled displays. We see these all over the place now. Um, out backpacking, also, what the hell is that? So, uh, these little drones now are so small, you can easily throw them in your backpack and they don't weigh that much. And um, we might be familiar with them because they seem annoying when we're trying to look at the, the beautiful vistas or whatever, um, and that happens. But um, they're also really, really powerful um, looking for lost hikers and things of that nature. I won't play this, um, but suffice it to say, we've all, especially in the last few months, we've all seen how drones have really come to be one of the defining aspects of, and before we used to talk about this in terms of Syrian war and Iraq stuff and whatever, now it's front lines on the Ukrainian war every day. And we'll, we'll eventually talk about our, 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 our surveys, our polls. One of the questions we put in in our polls, I, I, we usually have a, a fake question or a fake answer, one of the options. That's not to intentionally deceive people, that's just to measure our error. And for a long time, what we use is, I made up something that didn't happen. I said a drone uh, you know, attacked the Kremlin, crashed in the Kremlin. And that was one of the measures of if people were just like randomly ticking the survey and not paying attention. But now, it's happened. And so all these things that we seem to imagine, what if they are happening, right? So they're one of the main tools that people are both using in terms of intelligence gathering in the Ukrainian war and just outright physically attacking um, uh, other uh, groups. One of the main reasons that Russia uses so many drones in the war right now is because we, we, the US and the Western powers, have cracked down on Iran. So the last several decades, we've really cracked down on importing things and stuff. So Iran turned, it couldn't make missiles like it wanted to. So it started built its own industry making essentially suicide drones. And uh, they got really good at it. And that's why Russia is, fly is buying all these drones from, from Iran. So this sounds like a very macho war type story. I'm not trying to make it like that. But the point is, this technology is so portable, is so cheap, is so relatively easy to configure. That's why they've burbled up, right? So most of the production in Ukraine, initially it was all buying DJI products and stuff like that and order them off of Amazon and send them over there. Now they have, I forget the last quote, 67 something different startup businesses inside Ukraine where the Ukrainians are building their own drones for the various needs in terms of trying to defend their country. Um, but, but it all just speaks to the portability, the adaptability, and the, the usefulness of this, uh, of this technology. Okay, so we call this class remotely piloted systems because we have underwater systems as well as, as well as flying systems. For the first couple years, I tried to teach both the underwater, piloting our underwater drones and our flying drones. It just got a little much. So this class, we're gonna focus on aerial robotics, but we'll at least, at least we'll touch on the under, our underwater units. Um, they're much simpler, right? There are a lot more constraints because they're all tethered, so that means they're connected to us, but they're really useful for a whole lot of things. But, but that's why it's remotely piloted systems. It was, it was ostensibly, especially early on when they were cracking down on us and they were saying, you can't fly drones. We're like, oh no, this is not about drones, it's about remotely piloted systems. So that's why we have that name. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so I'll just say uh, a robot is a machine that can carry out complex tasks automatically um, with little intervention. And so these things that we're flying, these things that you will fly, all classify as a robot. We're gonna start out with you, 
you know, physically pushing this dial to make it do action A, and then pulling, pushing the other stick to make it do action B. But, uh, and so we'll learn that. So you guys will all be able to safely know how to launch a drone, fly it around, take some pictures, bring it back. We need to do that if there's some weirdness, if there's some, some problem or some emergency you need to take control. But, but the vast majority of time that we're using these for data collections, we're in uh, auto, autopilot mode, right? We're in a programming mode. We've, we've programmed a path and it's gonna do, it's gonna fly and take its pictures and we're just sort of waiting for it to come back. So that completely qualifies as the, t the term of a robot. Um, and so, uh, so I might sometimes say robot, flying robots and whatever, and, and that's what we're talking about. A lot of terminology here, a lot of terminology. Um, very common is UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle was the original term. And so you'll see, and because everything just is still on there, all the legal stuff, everything says unmanned, uh, 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 aerial vehicle. We've now, most of us have taken to trying to change that and to take some of the sexist language away, but it, UAV is just so ubiquitous, we're not going to change that. So the, the general convention is to now talk about unpiloted, even though you are a pilot. So even though we talk about unpiloted aerial vehicles, you might be on the ground as the pilot, but that's, that's the term of art. And so UAV is is, uh, and this is very similar to GIS, the language around GIS, those of you guys have had it. Um, so, so UAV is the actual thing, is the, is the device that's moving air and, and going up and down and taking pictures and stuff. Unmanned aerial system is that device plus your controller and any of the software and the sort of the system itself that makes the, the thing work. So you'll see UAV and UAS used very, very all over the place, stores, legal, uh, terms, all that kind of stuff. The other one that you'll see that's very, very common is sometimes you'll, especially for the kind of stuff we do, sometimes you'll see SUAS, which is small, which stands for small unmanned aerial systems. And, that, and that's all the stuff we're talking about would, qual you could, these are, could be used interchangeably. You can call it a UAV, you could call it UAS, uh, SUAS, whatever. The types of stuff, and we have all these things here. Uh, um, so the stuff on the back are, are things for you guys. We have, we have other ones that are ordered, but there's this huge back order, this huge supply chain thing. We've, it's been ordered for a while. We're still trying to get some more in. So we need more, and there should hopefully soon be a lot more for us. But, but in any event, those are ours. Those are student things. Those are the things you guys can use and we'll, we'll be using throughout the semester. There are other devices, some that are essentially identical to those, but maybe with just more sophisticated cameras, others that are different types of systems. So did Zach show you uh, like the EB and stuff last week? So, um, so uh, for example, um, this is the main body part, but the wings are in there, but the wing clips on, wing clips on, the sensor package goes in here, and this is a, a, what we call a fixed wing. So this is like, like an airplane looking thing, although it looks like a, it's a Delta airplane. So we have these types of things. We have things that launch from the ground like, and so this guy, which is super weird, you take it and you shake it, and then it kind of goes, <laughs> and then you throw it up in the air, and that's how you launch it. It seems like it looks super sketch. Like what? Like this could buy this in the back lot somewhere from some, some dude. Um, and then and then it, it flies itself. So this one you actually cannot control. So the only control we have with this type of device is if there's a problem, we say come back home. And so we can make it stop what it's doing and fly back to us, but we can't like make it swerve to the right or to the left, that type of thing. And then if we're really, really, really about to get in trouble, like flying to an airplane, the other option is just kill it. So there's a kill switch where it'll just stop and it'll just fall out of the sky and drop to the ground. Um, so, so this is really designed to not have any instantaneous piloting going on. Um, we have others, and so this guy, like I said, I throw him up like this, and if you look, he has sort of a, 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 a tougher a belly. When he's done, he comes flying around and he spirals down and then he crashes on, he, not crashes, it was called stalling. 
So the guy flies like this, gets really, really low to the ground, ideally over grass, and then slows, slows ways down. The last little bit, it pulls up, and then it kind of, it, 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 it flaps on its belly, and that's how it's designed to land. Um, others we have, other types of devices are called a vertical takeoff and landing. So same kind of idea, but this guy's gonna start on the, with its butt on the ground, and it's gonna start like a helicopter. <laughs> And then once it gets up a little bit, it flops on its side and then starts flying like an airplane. The basic type, the two broad types of things that we have are this type of device, which is called a fixed wing, so think of an airplane, and then a multi-rotor, um, which is what you guys will be, 99% of the time what you guys will be using. So there's, there are ones with three sets of propellers. There is, are ones that have four sets of propellers. There's ones like that over there that has six and, or eight. And, but, but they're all, they're all mul either multi-rotor or fixed wing. Um, so when I say uh, rotor wing, or we should actually, I should change this to the multi-rotor is a more common term now. Uh, this is a fixed wing, vertical takeoff and landing, like I mentioned. Underwater, we have some other terms, and I just mentioned those because they sound very similar and so they can be confusing. Uh, unpiloted surface vehicle is a new category of things that didn't exist 10 years ago, so this term is relatively new. These are for essentially autonomous sailboats and that kind of stuff that float on the surface um, uh, or, or autonomous surface vehicle. Uh, ROV is what most of our, is what all of our underwater robots are. And so that's a remotely operated vehicle. It's tethered. So that, that's a thing going around cruising, either taking samples or pictures or whatever with a tether. Um, and then we have the same kind of thing that is not tethered and that's an AUV. So we have UAVs and AUVs. It gets, gets kind of, you know, tricky here sometimes. Um, and then the term that nobody seems to use, but people were pushing for a while, UUV, but, uh, but, but you get the idea, right? There's a lot of Vs and a lot of As and a lot of Us sort of being thrown around in the, in the terminology here. Multi-rotor, all that kind of stuff. Uh, another one that I, I, I will say a lot, and, and Jay will, and Professor Seidel will say a lot, is FAA. So just to be clear, that's the Federal Aviation Administration, and that's the entity that both um, certifies aircraft as well as the entity that um, ma manages airspace, which is really important for us, and then also the entity that does safety, uh, safety inspections and things of that nature for things related to airspace or vehicles. Um, and because of the FAA, all those things in the back are classified as aircraft. And so because of the FAA, DJI, this Chinese drone maker, is the, lar is the, is the, the largest manufacturer of aircraft on the planet because those guys are classified as aircraft according to the U.S. government, which is kind of crazy, but that's how they work. Um, and an aircraft is anything that's up in the air, any flying thing that can change its own course. So the Chinese balloon that floated over the US, that's not technically an aircraft. Or a weather balloon is not an aircraft. Um, or, or someone that uh, jumped out of an airplane with a parachute, that's not an aircraft. But all these other things, according to the definition of aircraft, that's why these drones qualify as, as an as a airplane, essentially. It's essentially the same thing as an airplane. Okay, so this is the beast. This is the beast that really, uh, this didn't start at all, but this is the thing that really popularized it all. And so when we say drone, this is what most people have in their head. So this is a one particular design of a drone. It's a multi-rotor. So, so, so you and I could get on an airplane. I might have some experience with this. Fly, buy, say buy something on Amazon, put it in our bag, fly over to, um, fly over to uh, Australia, get out, turn on our thing, you know, get the satellite linked and all that kind of jazz, and then just go, it's some random place, go fly, no problem. They have um, uh, many more uh, examples of restricted airspace than do, than do we. We have uh, restricted airspaces too, which, which is what Jay will be covering in his side of stuff. Um, but you can just go fly. They also have a process where if you want to for like business purposes or we, uh, sort of the equivalent of R107, you register and that's pretty much it. If you want to do, if you want to fly in any of the restricted spaces, there's additional certifications you need to get. But, um, but and that's how most places are. 
And so one of the drones we're waiting for to come in, hopefully soon, is from a manufacturer called Parrot. That was a French manufacturer. So some of the, um, especially before the Chinese really took off with their manufacturing, the French were one of the best, um, a, lot of, a lot of our companies would go over to France to fly because they were much more lenient in terms of where people could fly. So it was a lot easier. Way back when, when I was telling you, we had to get a thing called a, you don't need to know this, but it was called a, a 333 exemption. And that's when I said we had to have a pilot's license. To get a 333, we had to, have, we had to be an aircraft pilot. And so getting an aircraft license is a hard thing, it takes a lot of time, uh, it takes about a year, it costs at least about $10,000, right? And you have to have an annual physical every single year. Um, so none of the other countries had anything coming close to that level of, of, of stuff. Where does our government Oh, sorry, I forgot to say, please also for the first week or so, you guys, when you say something, say your name first. So Lucas, yeah. Yeah, I'm Lucas. Uh, where does our government draw the line between hobbyist level drone flying and like you have to have a part 107 drone flying? Because there's, I know for a fact that a bunch of my friends fly drones and don't have the part 107. Like where's the line there? So the line is supposed to be if you make money. So if you exchange money for, so early on when the, like say eight years ago before the 107 rule came into effect, all the people who were doing real estate photography or anything like that, um, what they, the people that I knew, what they would do is, uh, or, or if somebody wanted, like a, a developer was thinking about doing this and they, wanted, they needed like a map of the hillside, right? They would hire someone and they would, they would fly for free. They would do, do drone stuff for free. But then they would put the images on a, on a flash drive and they would charge 700 bucks for the flash drive, right? So, 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 so that, that's how they were kind of legally getting around it. Um, nowadays, pretty much no one w should be uh, flying without insurance. And so that insurance is one of the things that will sort of, sort of trigger it. Um, but in general, if you guys, so, so there is no research requirement. Or, excuse me, there is no research license. So for us, we're not government. <coughs> and we're, I mean, as defined by most people like a government airplane. But we're also not commercial, so we're kind of this weird, but we're, all, we're clearly not hobbyists, right? When I'm telling you to go to this beach at this time to fly this thing to get this picture. So there, there is no category for research, so that's why we have the 107 requirement, because there's nothing else to require. Um, but for most of you guys, if you trigger uh, getting money, that's going to be the difference. The other thing is there's a size requirement. So also hobbyists are considered to only be flying small, so the kind of things back here. So if we got something, you know, any bigger than that, um, than that guy, the, 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 the than this guy right here, anything bigger than this, which you could totally buy, you could build or whatever, and that's usually a lot of, a lot of Hollywood folks that are carrying heavy camera packages that are, you know, doing sports stuff or whatever, that stuff will, will, will be above, will be heavy enough that that's considered not a, by definition, a commercial product. You either have to have a commercial license or you can get what's called an experimental license. So if we were like a research lab that was designing that or a company that was designing it, we can get a um, sort of experimental exemption, but none of that is considered hobbyist. Cool, all right. So this is a quadcopter. So this is what started me. This really, really revolutionized stuff. The control architecture was awesome. The, the, the design was fantastic, very simple to use, et cetera. Um, most of this technology was invented in the U.S., um, but we were just, uh, we, we couldn't really compete with the, with the manufacturing uh, capacity of folks elsewhere. The next big innovation was this. So as you guys will see, this will be the stuff you guys are flying. Here's the camera right here, all right? Here's the camera. Um, the battery's in the back over here, and these are, these are you know, propellers and arms and stuff. And then it has this rigid cage so that essentially the landing gear is always there. It's always there. And it's a nice protector for the, for the camera, right? So it's hard, you can't like really crash, the, it's, it's, well it's possible, but, but it's a little bit, um, it's fairly easy even if it were to crash to not damage the expensive camera. Next big innovation, and we had two of these before, we, uh, before they bit the dust, um, literally. Uh, this is an Inspire. Both of these are manufactured by 
uh, DJI, which is the, like, as I mentioned before, the largest, and, and DJI is just like, it's very similar to um, ArcGIS. There are lots of options out there, but they dominate the market. I mean, like, uh, they don't quite dominate as much as ArcGIS does, but probably something on the order of 70 to 80% of the airframes that are flying in the world are DJI products. Uh, and so this was, uh, this guy's was, was a different design. And when this guy would launch, these arms are down. And then once it goes up, it, it kind of bat wings up the arms out of the way. And then we have a camera. So this was one of the reasons why our original preferred staffing situation was four students for a research team. We don't really need that anymore. The idea was we have one person who's the pilot, who's, who's directing the craft a separate student on the camera. So somebody that, somebody else is just collecting the, the data. And then we always have an emergency spotter. So that person is not doing anything, not, not focused down, looking down, and he or she is just looking around, making sure there's no birds flying in or whatever. And then we would um, oftentimes, it still happens, but especially back in the day, you put up a drone and everybody's like, what's that? And they all want to talk to you. And when we're trying to be safe and focus on flying, it's hard to talk with people. So that fourth person is a floater that's not safety or whatever, but is just in charge of, of um, anybody that want to, wants to walk up. They walk up to them and say, hey, any questions? And they answer all the questions as opposed to distracting the people. Um, so, so our initial protocols for flying were driven much by this, by this craft. This was an Inspire one. Okay, another uh, big thing. You'll see these guys all on the sides. So this guy up here is one of them. This guy, um, this, uh, this was uh, very sad. This company still, still died. This is a 3D Robotics or 3DR. These guys were awesome. They gave us $10,000 of uh, busted units one time because they liked us so much. So one year we just pulled apart everything and the students just, we scavenged all these parts and built several really awesome units out of the, out of the, the waste. And that was because um, they liked us so much. And we were like super scrappy and, and doing all this cool stuff. This was an awesome system. We still have a few of these. I think we still have a few of these at Fly. Um, but this was an awesome system. This was, so DJI is like Apple, right? Awesome design, super high quality, really great. You cannot get into it. They're like, hey, you push the button. That's all you need to do, right? This was like a PC. So this was much more open. So we could get in and we could program everything. You could have access to everything. So for our research context, this was really, especially in the early days, this was really, really, really helpful. Um, uh, they started here, they moved their manufacturing to Tijuana, but they just could not keep up with the competition from China. They couldn't do it cheap enough. And so, um, so they, that company doesn't exist anymore. Um, but, but this was sort of the original, the original Mac versus PC of, of the drone, commercial drone world. Okay, and then, uh, then we have all kinds of other stuff. So we have, so in that upper, upper left, it's one of those uh, uh, eight, bla eight armed rotors that can carry a lot of stuff. In this case, it's carrying a very expensive uh, camera package for some Hollywood stuff. There's uh, smaller things like this guy over here. Uh, we've also seen the rise of drone racing. For a while, people wanted us to be involved our program to be involved with some reality television series uh, where we're like crashing drones. And oh, I thought that would be very fun. We're like, mm, maybe we don't want to be associated with crashing drones when it took me so long to get the system and campus to allow us to do stuff. Um, but the whole idea of drone racing, uh, all that stuff is basically small units, <laughs> go very, very fast with like VR head goggles. So instead of looking at a screen like we normally do, you're sort of immersed and go fast through an obstacle course. That was born out of the fact also that er early on the FAA said you couldn't fly outside. So people initially went into um, uh, warehouses and unused spaces and urban cores and stuff like that um, and started racing around inside. And then they figured out this is actually awesome. We don't need to be outside for these things. And so, so, so the, now there's Drone Racing League that has contracts with ESPN and all that kind of stuff. So that, that's a whole sort of subculture, sub-technology. And that's like the folks that like to trick out their hot rods, right? That's, you, you, I mean, you can trick out a phantom, but this phantom is for doing work and getting pictures, right? This is for like screwing around. Like, well, I tried the blah, blah, blahs, brother. It was like so better, dude, right? That kind of stuff. And then there's all these other uh, do-it-yourself stuff. 
An interesting element of this, as I mentioned before, where we will fly is, uh, was an airfield not created for drones, created for remote control aircraft. So as this drone stuff started coming on, you know, the last decade or so, it ran into a many, many decade history of hobbyists that were doing this stuff on their own. But they had to build everything themselves, right? They had to, they had to make the bodies, and, and, and it was basically, mostly it was old retired dudes, right? Mostly dudes, mostly old people, mostly engineers that worked in some kind of technology thing and couldn't let go of the, they were super geeky and love all this technology and could spend hours and hours like tweaking things. Um, and so we have all kinds, there's this history of all these uh, great remote control fields all around, including, as crazy as it sounds, one right near the border uh, in San Diego. Like, by the border, I mean like an eighth of a mile from the border, where you could just fly up your remote airplane and fly wherever you want. I'm like, really? That's, that was interesting. That's still there. Um, and so, so when the rules started coming on about the FAA, by, de by definition, they started applying to these remote control air pods. Like, dude, we've been doing this safely for decades. Why are you changing the rules? So all these sort of areas are part of the evolving world of, of unmanned or unpiloted, excuse me, aerial vehicles. Mentioned uh, 3DR. Um, there's also another uh, interesting part of the story for us that you guys should know about is aero environment. So they are um, the U.S.'s largest supplier of drones because they supply drones to the US government. So that means the military, but it also means uh, non-military organizations. And this is uh, one of their uh, versions that historically was used for the military, but is widely used by, in coastal situations now, especially by NOAA. And so I, I can share a video with you um, um, where uh, we've uh, piloted these um, these guys, uh, and they're really cool. They're also really useful for doing things like, like tracking illegal drug uh, stuff because they have all this military technology. So they can sort of say, hey, there's a whale or whatever. It'll, it'll follow the whale. It'll circle the whale. It'll track the whale. So, um, so that kind of stuff. And then we have this generation of all these startups that are coming along. So this is an example of a, a water-based, an aquatic drone. In this case, this is one that's going to float on the surface and has solar power, so we, solar, um, solar panels, and others have propellers. And so it can be out for months on end collecting data, either collecting data or collecting data and transmitting data. Um, all kinds of stuff. This is a version that uh, our friends at <clears throat> um, uh, uh, Blue Robotics, Blue Ocean Robotics, uh, uh, that was one of the manufacturers of one of our ROVs. They made this to go to Hawaii and back, and it did, right? And so cool stuff. Um, then we have some units that are getting power from unique sources. The stuff that we're doing, which is flying in the air, not so much. But these things that are in water or on land, they potentially could get energy from different sources. In this case, this guy drops down essentially a fin, a, a, a sort of series of fins underneath it, and the bobbing up and down of the waves provide it the energy it needs to operate. Um, and then there's all these little guys, big guys. We have one of these guys that someone gave us a, a, a much cheaper, much less sophisticated version of this. So if anybody wants to hack together a big underwater drone, I've not had time to uh, reassemble that thing. Um, and then uh, we have, uh, just like back in the day, we had these things. Big, need a big crane, need a bunch of people, need a big boat. And increasingly, as with the aero units, stuff has gone smaller. The technology has gotten very compact, very efficient, et cetera. And, uh, and this is an example of an autonomous underwater vehicle. Um, and this guy, you can't transmit data underwater, but it'll be underwater for a while, then pop to the surface and then transmit its data and then keep going. Um, one of the things that has allowed us to do what we're going to do, it's going to allow you guys to do what you are doing, is your phone, right? So the phone is a key aspect of this for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and so uh, I've, this, is, this data is, is about eight years old now, but it, it serves the point, which is um, stuff has gotten so cheap, so cheap, so cheap, so cheap, and so powerful, so powerful, so powerful. Right, so this is, this is how much it costs to do an iteration of a calculation over time. And, it, and the point is it's, just, it's crashing. It's been going down ever since. And it's having about every year. 
And um, what that means is things are getting more and more powerful. You can do more and more uh, complicated things for more cheaply every year. It also means that, that this thing has all kinds of stuff that we have benefited directly from in the uh, remotely piloted system pool. One, first thing we do made this, a lot of people like to play games. And a lot of their games are somebody holding this phone and tilting it right left. So the ability to sense how this phone is oriented very, very precisely, very efficiently, that type of spatial awareness has been key. And that has been incorporated into drones. It's got an incredibly low power drain. So, so you know, if we have a new phone, um, your battery can last you know, days you know, at times. Whereas back in the day when we, these phones first came out, like four or five hours and your phone was dead kind of thing. So very efficient, very powerful, and then um, uh, in increasingly accurate in terms of geospatial location, both using satellite stuff and other things such as Wi-Fi, cell tower, all that kind of stuff, which again was primarily driven by the cell phone industry. The drone industry has benefited from all of those um, inventions. Um, and then as I mentioned before, we can do a lot of this stuff in-house now. So this is Canvas, and Canvas is really and an ama we're amazingly lucky. Um, and so, um, uh, one, we're interdisciplinary. Uh, so this is an example. So Paul on the left used to work for um, the Intel program. The guy in, in, it was one of our majors and then was our first technician once he graduated. So Zach's position, he was the first version of Zach that we ever had. Paul Spar, he's awesome. Um, he now has his own uh, consulting firm that, and, and, gener and, and we might actually use some of his software. This uh, they, they make software to do mapping more simply and easy, easily for people. And then on the right, Tim uh, was also a guy in our lab for many years. He was a computer science major. He um, initially went to work for Pix4D, which is one of the software companies that we'll talk about when we get into mapping and stuff like that. So at one point, um, they didn't have that many employees in the US. I think four of their employees in their San Francisco headquarters were ESRM uh, students. Uh, so we, it was pretty cool. Um, and then as I mentioned, we just have a lot of these unique things, including the barn, including the hay barn that allowed us to, when, when things got weird and we couldn't be outside or whatever, to be here. We have that remote controlled uh, field, right? No, people don't have an airfield on their campus. That's super weird. And all these things have just really been fortunate that we've that have come together here on our campus and our program to be able to facilitate your, your all learning about these things. Um, one of the first things we were given I don't even know where this is now. I think I saved it. I think we we're gonna, people are going to throw it away. But this was um, a first iteration of a drone built by the Navy out at Magoo, or by consultants for folks out at Magoo. And this was state of the art in the 1990s. So this is a delta wing. So it looks very similar to the EB I just showed you. Um, a fixed wing, the propellers in the back, so those things sticking on the butt um, would normally have uh, you know, propellers attached to it. This is big. This is about uh, seven, feet, seven feet wide, um, and it's rigid. So, so the EB, when, next time I pull the EB out, you can feel it. it's, it's basically like rigid foam. This is hard, 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 hard plastic. All inside of here were all the guts. Um, so they had to, so they were basically getting, and this one had crashed, which is one of the reasons they gave it to us. These guys all cracked and repaired. Um, they had all kinds of sensitive, material that we weren't, we weren't allowed to know about, like how to do communication securely. So they pulled the, the communications part out. But, um, but this is one of the first drones that we were given and we started to get ready to use it and that triggered the campus understanding. Wait, what are you doing? You're using as, and then people said, well, you're using a Navy robot to, you're to kill people and we're not, shouldn't be killing people. Like, what, we're not killing people. Like, oh my God, why do you want to kill people? I said, no, I said, we're not going to kill people. And so it just caused all these, these strains. So, so this never, this, this flew very little for us but um, was really important in our getting permissions to do stuff. Um, has anybody heard of a Mechanical Turk? Let me know the story about this. So Lucas, what's the story of the Mechanical Turk? I know of it, I don't know the actual story. <laughs> Good answer, okay. So really, really, so this was, this was, this was like um, AI. This is like the first AI kind of thing, right? So, so th this is, this is um, you know, about, 300 years ago, um, basically it was a contraption that uh, people would pull out. And it's a, it's a big box and it's got, that's a marionette. So the, the, this guy right here 
is, uh, it's called the Mechanical Turk because he looked like he was a Turkish guy from the Ottoman Empire, right? So he's sitting there, and this is a chess board, okay? And so he would play chess with you. So you would sit there, and you'd set up the chess board, and you'd move your pawn, and, and then he would kind of tick, 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 move his pawn. And then you would you move your thing, and you would play like a, a decent game of chess. And people were like, oh my god, it's an it's a automaton, it's a robot, it's an android, it's an it's a, it's a own life form kind of thing, right? It was actually a scam. So there was a little small dude that was crammed into the box, and he could actually see stuff. So it was this guy that was making it work. But it, it looked like, it looked so, apparently to all reports, it fooled kings, it fooled you know, prime ministers and, and wealthy businessmen and all these people that supposedly had access to resources and could figure out what was going on. It wasn't just some random dude on the street that they, they tricked. Um, and so, so this is one of our first sort of uh, uh, you know, stabs at autonomy, right? At sort of creating something that can do something on its own. This was a scam, but the stuff that would come on later uh, uh, were not scams. Uh, this is one of our first automatic airplanes, what we might just call, call a drone or, or the first predecessor of a drone, 1916. And so this is very early in the days when we were just inventing you know, airplanes with people in it. The idea was this was a very rudimentary control system, but this could fly up and, and kind of do its own do. Um, uh, a lot of uh, people will, will know about um, the so-called V, V1, V2 rockets from the Germans as Germany was losing World War II, they got desperate, and so they started just throwing, so Germany was first about trying to like very strategically bomb people and slaughter people and commit genocide in a very regiment, you know, very regimented way. When they started losing, they just got chaotic. And so these were very ineffectual weapons of war. They were very effective psychological weapons because they'd throw these up, they'd point them towards London. And maybe they get to London, maybe they get somewhere else. But um, they had a very basic type of control mechanism, which was not precise at all. So for striking terror, it was very effective. For accomplishing a specific task, it was not. But this was another example of a type of drone. And you'll see a lot of this stuff has to do with war. That's because the folks that are underwriting this are mostly militaries. They have the budgets to do this, especially when the technology didn't exist. Um, and then we see, this is, a, this is an example from the 50s, uh, from the US government. This leads to um, the first iteration of uh, the current military uh, arsenal, which was developed by the US. And this is a Predator. And this is big. So this is the size of an airplane. right? This is not like a little thing on the back. Um, and, uh, and this was a revolutionary design for things we don't have to go into. But, but um, the, the rear uh, stabilizers and things were considered almost a joke when they first invented them. Um, so this is all about the flying. This part here is all about the sensing. And so depending on what device we have, these can stay up for almost continuously. They can stay up for weeks on end, and they can be refueled very efficiently. In addition to just everything else, because it doesn't have a person, you save a lot on the weight and the safety things we have to have and the, and the boarding ramps and the exit ramps and, and the, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so once, and so this this really proved its success in the first Gulf War. So up to that point, this project was canceled almost several times, and it was it was like one of these things, which was, which was sort of oh we'll use it occasionally here. This people said oh my gosh. So after the early 90s, then these things start to go into mass production and start to go crazy. We did not have access to this technology because this was all classified. So there was a lot of people making a lot of money but not you and I, not the commercial users, the, the recreational users or whatever. It was locked away behind top secret clearances and stuff. This is what broke the door open. So people started inventing the control systems, especially the fantastic control systems for the, for the DJI products that self-stabilized. So before this, if you just bought a toy hobbyist one, you could fly it and it's very common. You're like, Ying, like, hey, I can do this, it's easy. And you kind of fly over here, Ying, like this is cool. They go a little faster. And then you, you turn a little bit and it becomes very unstable. And then boom, and it crashes. You're like, oh, damn, right? What DJI figured out was, was this self-stabilization routine. So even if I'm moving forward, or if I'm moving back, it, it, it'll, it'll self-correct. And it's, it's much harder to crash one of these modern drones than, than either a toy thing you get for 50 bucks from the store or something from, say, a decade or so ago. 
So really, the Phantom, which comes out in 2006, and is initially not taken up. It takes about three, four years for people to really get into it. Then it starts to take off. What was the but you guys say your name. Oh, sorry. I'm Alexis. Um, what was the price point for that one? <sighs> like I'm trying to remember. Uh, this was, I should know the answer. That's a good question. I should double check. This was, I think, originally about about a thousand bucks. So the ones now we get the equivalent. So the equivalent of this now is the Phantom Four, um, and now uh, now if you got a new Phantom Four, we're probably talking like twenty five hundred, two thousand ish. Most of that price though comes from the very fancy cameras. So this had a this had a equivalent of not quite a GoPro quality camera back then. So so th all this part is. These guys manufacture and everything is like pretty cheap. These things, historically, they bought from other manufacturers. And indeed, if you get something that's a, anything other than just a simple camera, mostly those are being supplied by other, FLIR next to us here makes a lot of the thermal imaging devices, for example. Um, but, but yeah, it was, it was something like that. Um, and, then, and then 3DR came out, was the first really big open source thing that you could, you could tweak. And these guys didn't even put cameras on their devices, so this is, a, this is literally a GoPro. So the idea with that was they kept their prices down. These guys were cheaper than DJI, and, and it's because they didn't have all that, that sensor package built in. Uh, yeah, we talked about that guy already. Um, now, so I'm talking about drones like they're a great thing, right? And they are, and they're super useful, and they're, they're going to be awesome. We'll, we'll break for a, a, take a, a bathroom break in a second here. But... Um, but it's really important to say that there's a lot, there are, there has been, there continues to be a lot of concern. My comments about, about you know, risk managers and stuff, uh, you know, I don't mean to be flippant. Those are real concerns. We want to be safe. Much of the reason the landscape is the way it is now, because people did not pay attention early on to concerns. The FAA didn't understand what the drone industry could be like. So they were like, clamp it down, clamp it down. All they listened to were pilots. The pilots were like, screw that. We want to be able to fly wherever we want to fly, right? We should be able to fly over your house as they can do. We want to be able to fly our helicopters in downtown LA as they can do. But then when we try to do that, like, whoa, 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 you can't do that, right? So not listening to the concerns of all of our community, as we know from all aspects of ESRM, is a recipe for disaster. And so I'll just run through a quick example here. These are people in Los Angeles with a, a homemade sheet that says drone free LAPD. What are they doing? They're protesting that Los Angeles Police Department was getting a, a new trove of, uh, of drones. And people were like, screw that. We have concerns with how the LAPD comports itself, generally speaking, it's particularly for low income communities, communities of color and all the things we know about. And so there's you know, a, a, a lack of trust, shall we say, between the groups. And so, so, but it wasn't just somebody saying like, hey, maybe we should try this technology out. The drones that the LAPD was trying to purchase, or actually did purchase, and was, was, com was coming to them at this point, this is about eight years ago, came from, and you want to guess where they came from? Iran. Not Iran. Good guess, though. I like that guess. China. What's that? China. China? Uh, uh, I guess, yeah, I probably some of them were manufactured in China. Like military? Uh, ooh, good guess, but no. Seattle Police Department. So the Seattle Police Department bought a bunch of drones and like, hey, we're gonna fly this. And then everybody's like, whoa, dude, we don't trust you. So the Seattle Police Department was like, oh, I guess we're not gonna use drones then. So we're not gonna, we're, we're gonna get rid of them. Anybody want them? LAPD is like, we want them, having just come from an organization that bought these without having a policy in place or any policy about, about privacy or anything else. <laughs> and so the LAPD is like, well, we'll take them, right? And so they walked into this totally, totally, totally unnecessary stress. Like, you know, that was, it was complete dumbass. There's no other way to describe it. In contrast, our folks here in Ventura County, our Ventura County sheriffs, they've been using drones for a long time. But what they did is they first started with a policy. So they started with a policy. Initially and primarily it's used for search and rescue, so out in the mountains. So they said, hey, here's the policy. We won't fly it over people's houses. You know, da, 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 da. And so they developed it 
consulted with county supervisors. They had opportunity for the public to provide input. And that's how it started. And then only once that we had these policies in place did the Ventura County Sheriff then go and start to get the stuff, right? So there's right ways to do this and wrong ways to do this. This technology is very powerful, very useful, but if we use it incorrectly, even though we might not have ill intention, if we're not hearing our community like everything else in ESRM, we will screw the pooch, right? We'll, we'll taint the waters and then people will distrust us or other groups or whatever for, for reasons they shouldn't be distrusting us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think well I think in any large city there's some concern about policing in, in general yeah. um, but I think in that case it was it wasn't I don't think I mean I have to go back and refresh my memory but in that case I don't think it was that people were worried about abusing um, abusing people, like individual people per se, it was more about concerns about privacy, so general concerns about privacy. So people were, um, this was very new in drones, and, every, and so it might be a little hard for you guys to imagine, but back in the day, we were restricted from doing stuff, right? And all official groups were really restricted, but Joe Blow hobbyist flying over the 101, um, crashing into the White House, uh, they're just like, woo, like a 12 year old, like I'm doing some cool shit, right? And so that really painted this picture of out of control, irresponsible, dangerous. And then like every, it seemed like every other year there was a story, it was, seemed to usually be in the South, usually the rural South, where somebody's, you know, teenage daughter was sunbathing out on the deck and somebody flew a drone over her and then the guy got a shotgun and shoots at the drone and then it like people like, what, my personal privacy? And it, like th those kind of stories, which are a very, very small occurrence, but they just, it's like catnip for the media. They're like, whoop, and then it'll be like everywhere and they'll pick it up and it'll become national news. And, you know, guy shoots drone out of the air with salt, salt. Um, so anyway, so our current policy here, we're in the process of revising this. Our current policy is this. So, um, and this policy that we created was the first one in, uh, one of the first ones in the country. It was definitely the first one in California. And then the, our policy became, so initially the CSU said, nobody can fly. And then we developed this policy with our administration. And then this policy was cloned by Humboldt. And then this became either this or the equivalent uh, became the floor that all the other CSUs had to use. And then the UCs later on, um, they have a slightly different policy, but this was important in shaping their policy. So our policy here became the sort of, uh, you know, first shot out the gate for using drones safely. And essentially what it says is we have a, we have a, a safety board. And when we want to fly for this class or for a research project, we make an application. And we say, hey, I have this project and this site under these conditions and we want to fly it. And so there's faculty, there's administrators, there's lawyers, and there's members from outside experts from the public that sit on the board and review our applications. So that's our unmanned systems board, called unmanned systems, that's what legally what it's called. Um, and then uh, we've done all kinds of things. So, so most of the drones we've built for organizations are mostly underwater ones. This is the first, uh, this is the first underwater drone that we um, built. This is from a kit. Um, this is called Open ROV, and now the Open ROVs are, are much more robust. But back in the day, um, the, so it came in pieces and we had to assemble this. So the very first one we built for a nonprofit in Hawaii, and uh, <laughs> my students used um, wood glue or, or Elmer's glue. So it looked great, and then we put it in the water, and after about 30 seconds it started leaking. I'm like, what's going on? So we did everything wrong, but essentially this is, this is total... Um, in fact, there's, there's, there's one downstairs, I think downstairs in the, in the cabinet, if you guys want to look at. But basically, this, these are D, D bat, this is tubes to hold D batteries. This, and there's a, a thruster up here, and there's a thruster out back. And then this is a backup camera from a minivan, because it turns out backup cameras are really good at low light, and they're a very wide angle view, right? So when people hit the backup, they're, they're seeing people walking from this side and that side all in one view. Um, and so this was, uh, this was uh, one of the first things that we, that we really started building. And then we started getting calls from Africa and different parts of the world. We'd build these things and then send them over, uh, primarily as, as, as an educational tool for kids that uh, maybe 
uh, couldn't swim or, or hadn't been in the water or, or other groups and people could actually see what their lakes or their streams or their uh, coral reefs or whatever uh, look like. Um, yeah. And this is some of our students building some of these first ones. This is down in Modoc. This is, this is before we had this lab. We were first only in Modoc. And so that's what we did. This is, we also did stuff, even simpler versions. This is a version that just has some thrusters and there's no computer. It's just hardwired into this control box, which is on off. So you can make this propeller go on off or this propeller go on off. And, uh, and this is a, a PVC cage. This is ultra, ultra cheap. And so this is for students in high schools and in middle schools doing um, drone racing competitions. So like robotics uh, types of things. Um, and then, uh, it's, it's been closed now because we're renovating that building, but, but then we started our partnership with the Ventura County Office of Education. And so they originally started a, a, a program at the airport for students to get pilot's licenses. And so that was going on. And then when drones started coming on, they're like, hey, maybe we can show kids how to do this. And so, so then they moved that operation here to campus. I was in the first two semesters oh, that class. there you go. Yeah. See, there, so how was it? Super cool. And so did you end up getting your pilot's license or just drone or would you end up getting? I did it before the FAA was, okay. uh, did the part 107. I ended okay. up getting my part 107, but um, yeah, it was a super fun class. Were you here on yeah. campus? Next, next okay, perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Look at that, a, a product. That's, that's awesome. I love it, I love it. So this space has been closed just because we're renovating that building now. But, um, but you'll see like this red thing is the thing in the back over there and stuff. So, so the parts have mostly been assembled up here, although some of the stuff is too big and is in storage at the moment. Um, but yeah, another great example of the stuff we're doing. Um, and we were bursting at the seams and we were, everybody was stepping on each, on each other until we um, moved up here. And so this, um, was, this space has really been great for us. So we're meeting in here right now, right? Obviously this is our classroom. Um, my coastal class meets in here. But for the most part, this is our, this is our space to work on drones, Gazuntai. So if you guys, and you do not have to do this for class, right? Or class, you guys just show up, learn how to fly. If that's all you want to do, that's cool. But if this is of interest to you and you guys want to start getting into stuff, we have all kinds of projects that we need, and this is our space to, to work on them uh, for the most part. Um, yeah, so this is, I was mentioning for, like, early on, we had to fly indoors. This is in grand salons. This is us teaching the class in... Uh, in Grand Salon, and then we've done all kinds of other things since then. Um, and then if, just a few examples of the kind of stuff that we can use, and then we'll break, um, which is, uh, so this is a, this is a, a very, this is a, a, the first rendering of a map of one of our bases for, in the Cook Islands, um, mapping all these reefs, um, uh, doing a lot of it. We've done, done a lot of education. This is a, a tour from a group in, um, I think these guys are from Norway or something. Um, we're very poor, right? So in one sense, that sucks because we're poor, but it's made us, it's forced us to be, uh, like you can use different words. I like the word scrappy, right? <laughs> scrappy. So we do a lot with a little bit. So this is one of our first uh, flying helmets that was a welding helmet that we just took out the glass and put a phone in there. Um, and, and pretty much everything we do, we're constantly adjusting or, or we're doing something wrong. We're figuring out how to change it. So for our field, Field labs or, or field times, we usually have to bring a bunch of crap out because we're crashing something or we're figuring something out. And I'll tell you a story about that in a second. Um, but you know what we get at the end of it, and what you guys will we'll, we'll just start we'll start to show you guys how to do this. When we get towards the second half of the semester, you guys will start making or le at least one. We'll we'll see how fast we go. So um, we've normally reserved this for our, the part two of this class but we're tr I'm trying to pull that into this part. So we'll be doing some 3D mapping. So this is all from still pictures, this is all from two dimensional photos. And we've, we've created, a th and the basic idea here is we take a bunch of overlapping photos, everybody stick your finger out in front of your face and close one of your eyeballs and look at your finger. And then close the other eyeball and open the other eyeball and your finger jumps a little bit, right? So essentially we just do that a lot with a lot of math. So we take all these photos that are a bit overlapping. So it's not, it's not one photo, move a mile, take a photo, but it's one photo with a certain percentage of overlap and there's different optimization routines. And then it take picture, picture, picture. And then because our drones know where they are in space, we also grab the GPS location. It says this photo was the first one, this next one is here, this next one is here, this next one is here, like that. 
and that those two pieces of information, we take those photos and we figure out how they stitch together. And this is all autonomous. You don't figure this out. The computer program it stitches them all together. And it figures out how can that possibly be? Well, that couldn't possibly be unless it was at a right angle. And so it'll then create a topology, create a three-dimensional surface of what the thing that was being taken pictures of was like. And then the last step is we take those photos and we re-stretch them over that frame. And that's how you get this, this three-dimensional model. And then from that, we can measure rates of cliff falling down. We can measure how tall the trees are. We can do all kinds of stuff. Um, and this technology is awesome. So if you have, if grandma has a photo from her wedding, a funeral, a quinceanera from the 1950s, if the person stood like this and took a picture this way and then turned a little bit and took another picture and then turned a little bit and took a picture, and I found pictures like this from my work at Stanford where uh, we, these guys took 360 photos, right? Before we had 360 photos, like one north, one if there's enough overlap, you can take grandma's pictures, throw them into this program, and it'll recreate the room that the wedding was in or whatever it is, right? So it won't know if, it's, if each pixel is a mile wide or a millimeter wide, but that doesn't matter, right? And so this, this photo stitching software, or we call structure from motion technology, is incredibly useful and powerful. So, um, so We'll, we'll, we'll get exposed to this. We won't do a huge amount of this. We'll, we'll get exposed to this. You guys will all do a project where we're going to map probably Cam Park. So you guys will get exposed to this stuff. Yeah. Got to say your name, Lucas. Lucas, again. Would that work even if all the photos are from different sources of camera? I sure. Mean, sure. Sure. Angles, sure. Overlap. Sure. It, work, you know, it works best when they're really, really precisely overlapped and when you have GPS. But yes, the only issue is it'll take longer to do. It'll take longer to do. Um, okay, and then, and, then why, and then one of the great advantages to this, and Hawaii is a perfect effing example of this, right? If I do assemble people that we're going to go monitor what the degraded water quality is doing to the whales, oh my god, that would take forever. i got to call people, get permission. We have marine mammal permits. We have the endangered species permits. We have the protected area, the sanctuary permits to be in Hawaii. We have the technology to fly stuff. And so when we're poised, not that I want to have a disaster happen this semester or whatever, but, but as these things happen, the Woolsey fire, oh my God, now the hillsides are melting down. We need somebody to go out and map this. We get called. Hey, can you guys come map this? In the case of the Refugio oil spill, which happened uh, at the start of summer, we brought everybody to school and we we're getting ready to start our annual beach monitoring. If you guys haven't helped us with our annual beach monitoring, then next summer you should totally come and work us, with us on our project. Um, everybody, finals had just wrapped up. I sent everybody home for a two week vacation and then we were going to start our beach monitoring, you know, like 10 days from then. All of a sudden, I'm taking my son to his Boy Scout meeting. And as I'm, as I'm driving there, I get a phone call from a reporter saying, hey, can, what's, can you, what's up with the oil spill? I'm like, oil spill? Like, what are you talking, can you talk about the oil spill? Because I used to work on oil spills when I was an undergrad, and so I kept working on, on oil spills. And I said, sure, there's an oil spill? He's like, yeah. He's like, can I come talk to you, interview for the, whatever the hell it was, evening news? And I was like, uh, wait, right now? She goes, yeah. And I said, okay. And so it's like, I said, but I'm going to be at this church parking lot, at like this random spot. I'm like, that's fine, I'll come to you. I'm like, okay. And so, um, uh, like, she rolled it up, like, Googling, like, what is oil spill happening right here? <laughs> right? And, um, and so then we're like, oh, my God, our beaches that we've been monitoring, our beach. In fact, Refugio was the epicenter of where the spill happened. And so we're like, damn. So I so talked to her. I'm like, oh, yes, yeah, so we're working on that. And, yes, we have it really under control. And we don't, we're not sure about this and that. And I told her all truthful stuff. And she's like, okay, thanks. I'm like, hang on. And then she left. I'm like, oh, and I called her. Oh, my God, everybody has to come in right now. And half the people were gone. The other half people were like, what? We haven't been training. I'm like, who cares about training? Come to school real quick. And so, so one of the first things we did was grab our robots and got on a boat that was run by the Santa Barbara Channel Keeper. And we went out with them. Well, actually, for the first thing we went, first thing we went up the next morning. So within 12 hours of hearing about it, we were out in the field. And we had our drones. And we were going to start to map the, the distribution on the beach. Um, that didn't happen because we have, which you guys will all learn about, a TF, a, a temporary a flight restriction, TFR, um, meaning you can't fly drones. 
Uh, and we'll talk a lot about that because there's a lot of BS that's gone around this, this whole idea. But anyway, um, they, they shut down the airspace, which makes total sense because they had emergency planes and, and that kind of stuff. But we're like, dude, we're ready to go. And like, yeah, you can't. Turns out all the, there's a, a bunch of people that normally do the monitoring were actually away to conference on the East Coast. So we would have been the first ones there, but that's fine. So then we just went to our site and started monitoring our Sandy Beach as the oil was about to come ashore. So it was like we could smell it. We could see it start to come ashore. They kick everybody out of the beaches. But then because we have those vests on, which you guys are going to wear, and we looked all official, and we were official, um, they're like, oh, I guess you guys can stay. So, everybody get kicked. so we got to monitor some of the beaches before the oil actually hit. And then, um, and then after, that next, after that first day passed, then, it, then people started figuring out what was going on and how big the spill was and everything. And so then we got on a boat with the Santa Barbara Channel Keepers and we went up north and we went to where the spill was and people were saying, oh, there's no oil on the ground or there's no oil, oil being deposited uh, on, subtitly. And we're like, that's awesome. But let's just double check and make sure that's right. So, our, so those drones, these guys that we were originally building for non educational nonprofits were the tool that we jumped, we threw in the water and we're taking video. And that's the video that went out to like media and, and, and things of that nature and stuff. So, so the, our very nature where we're trying to get you all trained in this class. So we're, and we have plenty of time. We're not rushing here. I want you guys to all be safe. Once you know how to use these tools, we never know when they're going to be used. But because we're prepared, we can respond very quickly. Maybe it's Lahaina, like we're going to do this January. Maybe it's New Orleans after storms. Maybe it's our own town after a wildfire. These are really powerful technologies, and we want to make sure you guys are at least familiar with them by the end of the class. And this is just an example of our, our work in uh, Lahaina. This is the first year we did, this is the second year we used drones instead of doing it from, um, this is all based on boats, but instead of uh, using primarily human observations from an angle, we're using drones. So what you can do with this is you can, I mean, she's all breaching and everything there, but so I can, I can pause it. Well, that was a bad pause. Anyway, I can pause this and what we'll do is we'll, we'll take video with the boat in the picture so we know how high we, what the elevation of the craft is, right? We're looking straight down, directly camera pointed point directly straight down. And then we can measure how big mom is or, or the boat, or if we're out in the middle of the desert and we can measure how big the car is or whatever, whatever the known distance is. And we can say, ah, oh, this is like five meters. And so we can get a very accurate measure of the individual and we can measure the girth and we can use that as in calculations of body condition. And so one, we're figuring out what, what, where mom is in space, mom and baby is in, are, are in space. Uh, and then we can figure out what they're, we can document their behaviors. Are they doing happy stuff? Are they doing nursing stuff? You know, what's going on? But then we can also look at their, their physiological condition all without disturbing them. And, and they can't see this drone, right? A boat that's nearby, they can hear it and they probably don't like it. Um, and so it used to be to get this data, you need to be fairly close. Now we can be farther away, not disturb the resource so much get even better quality than we used to get. And so that's, again, the power of this uh, technology. I'll kind of la la last bit here, just finishing up. This is uh, some of our work in the Cooks using, um, uh, and so in this case, we built our little educational drone and this group in the UK, this research lab in the UK, built a very fancy light that generated light at a very specific wavelength. We designed our stuff here, they designed our stuff there, and then we flew and met in the Cook Islands. And I'm like, oh my God, I hope it's working. Oh my God, I hope it's working. And it turns out because we built them to this, this certain standards, they plugged in together, worked fantastically well. And we were able to take photos of, um, of these coral, and, and in this case, this is tridacna, giant clams. And we were using um, a certain wavelength of light that was being emitted. So, so the pigments were being excited at a certain wavelength. And then we had a filter in front of our camera. So that only allowed other certain wavelengths of light to get to the camera. And amongst other things, so I have it here, amongst other things, we saw this. So when you looked at this, this individual coral, it looked like it was a, it looked cool. It's a piece of coral, right? Whatever. Um, when we looked under the UV light, there was this evidence of what looks like it was starting to be um, one of the banding diseases, but you couldn't tell it with your bare eyes. So this seemed to be a useful insight and is maybe another way to talk about sensing these reefs 
um, before they get so, so hurt that they're like extensively sick. So all that kind of stuff comes from having cheap, really powerful technology that's in your hands. Students that, in addition to doing stuff for me, you guys do your own projects, right? So you guys have capstone projects. If you guys wanna, you know, hey, I got this idea, can I do this? Right now, the only things you guys can use are our, are our uh, you know, trainer drones, but we have these other drones, like the EB and other things, that once you get your 107, you, we can check you guys out on that, and you can, and you can start to help us with these, these um, uh, units that are more useful in a research con. I mean, th those, those work for a lot of the things you wanna do, but, but um, all of that is, is from the stuff we do, and I'll just say that um, all this is also about um, uh, very much so helping other groups. So this is all built around understanding and helping um, bring other groups along with us. Um, and uh, we'll be doing a, a survey here, and I'll just say that, uh, well, we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about it later. Questions? Lucas. Yeah, 